want to avoid common mistakes in Snowflake? If so, I'm going to share with you the top five mistakes I see with Snowflake implementations. My name is Adam Morton, and I've worked with Snowflake since 2017 across a number of different implementations. And one of my challenges was getting hold of good real world content. So I hope this video helps you. I'm always on the lookout for these mistakes when I first start working with a Snowflake client. I'm going to share them with you, so hopefully you can avoid the same ones, saving you time and money. If you stay until the end of the video, I'll be giving you some specific links to help continue your knowledge. So hang on till the end for that. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, the bell to be notified every time I post a new video about Snowflake. OK, so let's get into it. So mistake number one, using the account admin for everything. So the account admin is the most powerful account in Snowflake, allowing you to do pretty much everything within the service. And therefore, Snowflake recommends to use it sparingly. Don't use that role for every single thing that you do in within your account, even though it might be the easiest path to get there. Lots of teams have worked with get access to this account initially when Snowflake gets delivered to them. And as soon as they discover that other roles don't have certain privilege out of the box, they just switch back to account admin and use that to carry out every single operation that they need to do. And it's a really bad habit and one that's really easy to fall into. So make sure that you avoid using account admin for everything. What are my recommendations with the account admin role then? So change the password immediately and store it securely in a secrets manager. Limit the number of users who can use that account to just two or three people, so there's cover in case somebody is out of the office or um, on holiday or off sick. So again, don't spread that password and give that account access to just anyone in the in the team. Enable multi-factor authentication on this account. If you're going to do MFA on any account, this is the one to do it on. Really make sure that you look after this account and only use it and for the critical operations. Mistake number two, so not mapping workloads to virtual warehouses correctly. So what do I mean by this? So I've seen instances where companies are using a single dedicated warehouse for every single workload, whether that's a large workload or quite a small quick query. And every single query that consumers have and um, data visualization tools that are hitting the system have is everything is hitting that same warehouse and then that can create contention issues you can get queue and queries and there's no real need for that okay so there's no real need to have one single dedicated warehouse for everything snowflake provides that flexibility and the t-shirt size around warehouses for that reason so you can segregate workloads you can size your virtual warehouse appropriately I've also seen the, the opposite being true for some other clients. So using a different warehouse for each and every type of workload. And needless to say, that can create a lot of idle resources and a lot of um, spent credits on warehouses sitting there, which are just idle and not adding any business value. So a few recommendations just to underline that fact. So separate your work workloads intelligently so you get a good balance of cost and performance. This also opens the door to cross charging because it gives you good visibility into different departments using what resources. So it allows you to do that. And also gives you a good level of visibility and transparency across each and every workload that you're running. Problem number three, so no consistent approach to managing user access. This is a big one. So Snowflake follows a role based access control or RBAC model and it enforces that very tightly. Um, it forces you to, to pick a role when you run a query and um, it checks that role to see what privileges you have to, before executing the query. Out of the box, there are a handful of roles which fit into a hierarchy. But extending that initial uh, hierarchy that comes with Snowflake by adding additional custom roles starts off relatively easy, but can quite quickly turn into, into something very complex, complex and hard to manage. So. Let's just have a look at the out of the box role hierarchy. So you get five roles, account admin at the top being the most powerful role, as we mentioned earlier. We've got security admin and user admin. And then sysadmin and then a public role, which just allows you just access to, to log into Snowflake. 
so you're going to have to customize this and extend it for your own uh, your own company and your own requirements and you've got to be really careful how you do that because in many instances this is one thing i see um, people get getting seriously wrong and get into a lot of trouble so my recommendations here would be to logically separate roles into domain functional and access roles what do i mean by that so system roles are predefined system roles which all your subsequent custom roles should roll up to so it acts as a parent for those child roles domain roles should be used when you require groups of functional and access roles separated out for different environments like dev test production functional roles they should be used to contain users uh, they might be mapped to roles within an identity provider, or IDP, which contain groups of users, and that's how you, you manage them within the IDP and map them to the functional roles. And then finally, splitting a final layer into access roles, which are used to assign privileges on the actual objects within Snowflake. So that makes it a lot cleaner and a lot easier to segregate roles in that way. By doing that, it allows you to make role inheritance your friend to streamline the management overhead. So inheritance means that not only privileges can, can be assigned um, to, on objects directly to roles, they can also be inherited from other roles. And following this approach promotes the reuse of roles and it reduces the number of roles that you need to administer and it makes things a lot easier. I'll be really interested before we move on to the final two mistakes, just to ask you what the biggest mistakes you've came across and what you would add to, the, to this list. If you can comment below and let me know, I'll be really interested. And if you're struggling with your own Snowflake implementation or need any advice, I'd love to help. And um, by all means, reach out to me at the email address on the screen and let me know how I can assist. So moving on to problem number four, the fine tuning auto standby of virtual warehouses. The default Snowflake's virtual warehouse is going to standby mode after 15 minutes. But what happens if you have a job which executes a bunch of queries which take on average five minutes to run every hour throughout the business day? Well, this will result in an additional 15 minutes of idle time after the five minute query executes where the warehouse is sitting there doing absolutely nothing every single hour and that is costing you as the client money. And we'll see that in an example in a, in a moment. So let's just give you an example of what that might look like in a in a hypothetical scenario. So consider a large warehouse, let's say uh, that's made up of eight nodes. Let's say it's around 30 US dollars an hour to run to run one of those. And in here we've got um, an example of a workload that runs on the hour every hour throughout the business day from 8 a.m. through till five in the afternoon that consistently that, that query takes about five minutes to run. And let's say that you don't change the default settings to auto suspend that warehouse and the default is 15 minutes. So as soon as that five minute query finishes, it'll be a further 15 minutes until that warehouse actually goes into suspended state and stops costing you money. So you can see here on the hour, every hour, you have a five minutes uh, query of execution time and then we've got 15 minutes of, of time where the the warehouse is sitting there idle not doing anything but costing you as the constant client money every day then that's 50 minutes in total of the execution time when you're actually getting real value from that and two and a half hours of idle time if we translate that into the credits into spend you're looking at 25 Five. bucks a day where you're paying for actual real value in terms of the queries being executed and 75 dollars where those warehouses are sitting there idle. Extrapolate that over a working month, let's say 20 days in this example, and you can see that the costs become quite significant. So it's really important that you look at your workloads that you anticipate um, to be running on your account, evaluate them periodically over time, and make sure that you have a, a good balance between the different sizes of warehouse and that you've got the auto suspend and um, set correctly. My recommendations for, for this one is to analyze your workloads and select a auto suspend time or standby time which works for you. Just bear in mind that constant shutting down and starting up the warehouses might well be inefficient. For example, Snowflake will always bill you for the first 60 seconds and the cache might also be flushed from, from the virtual warehouses. If you know the warehouse is going to be idle, don't rely on auto standby run the SQL command to spend your warehouse at the end of the job. So in the example I gave before, after your execution time is finished of that query, which takes five minutes, 
hit the SQL command to put your warehouse into suspend, so you're not wasting credits with having the, the compute up and running within your warehouse. And finally, problem number five. So this is data consumers and administrators understanding the pay-as-you-go usage model. Why is this important? So this was never really a thing in the traditional database management system space before. And I've had some really good discussions with um, people who are new to Snowflake and need to uh, consume data from it, maybe data scientists or data analysts, um, when you can actually show them and discuss how much their specific queries are costing in a, in a monetary amount. And it makes people really think then about what code they need to run, how to write it to make it as efficient as possible and not set queries off um, without a second thought and kind of leaving them running overnight, for example. And so, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, users will execute queries and select any warehouse without considering the cost involved, without without anybody taking them through how best to kind of use and leverage Snowflake service. Some of my recommendations here, obviously to, to talk to your data consumers, help them understand how to balance what they need to deliver to their to their internal customers against a warehouse size and the, and the costs that are going to be involved. It also makes people ask that, that question and drive some cultural change where, you know, how important is the query to to the business? Uh, you know, does it need to run really, really quickly or is running on a smaller warehouse and letting it take longer going to be more efficient? However, it does present really good opportunities to get business critical queries or one-off jobs turned around very quickly. You can quick, quite quickly scale that warehouse up and, and run the query and uh, and get the results back so you can you can move on to the next thing. Finally, I just want to mention some resources. Udemy, I've got a Snowflake practice question test to help you prepare for the Snowbro core cert certification. Follow me on LinkedIn. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this useful. And Finally, I just want to mention I've got a new book coming soon and Building Solutions with Snowflake, which will be published by A-Press. Um, I hope you find this useful. Thanks very much.